this way. Uh, have, have you ever wanted to detect and quantify small amounts of chemicals? Do you not want to spend $40,000 on the proper analytical equipment? Well, boy, do I have the solution for you. Introducing the new LPLC system. At only 50% hot glue and duct tape by mass, this detector is guaranteed to not give you accurate results. Compared to the competition that has safety in mind, our device only leaks small amounts of flammable salt. But don't worry, you'll be using this machine in style with your mandatory sunglasses, I mean laser goggles, as this machine leaks harmful UVC radiation. Uh, I guess, welcome to DIY Biotech? High pressure liquid chromatography, or HPLC, is really an ingenious system for detecting low concentrations of chemicals in liquid solutions. A high pressure pump pushes a solvent through a column that's packed with solid particles. The solvent and solid system, called the mobile and stationary phases respectively, are carefully chosen so that your chemical of interest sticks to the column for a longer period of time than other chemicals. If you vary the flow rate and composition of the mobile phase, you can elute or wash out your particular chemical at a specific time point. This fascinating technology is used in the research and quality control fields. In my research, I use it to identify compounds that yeast produce, but it's also used for many other biological and chemical applications. In quality control, it's used to detect compounds like alcohol and beer, or cannabinoids and pesticides in cannabis products. Unfortunately, the cannabis industry in particular is very young and thus has little regulation. This leads to many backyard chemist types starting processing facilities. These facilities are more likely to produce a product of lower quality or even with dangerous contaminants. Like imagine trying to buy a CBD product that has a significant amount of THC or buying a THC product with carcinogenic solvents. These are the problems that the industry faces. These issues are exacerbated by the fact that HPLC machines cost about $40,000, are difficult and expensive to maintain, and require knowledgeable staff to operate. For large corporations, HPLC equipment is an obvious purchase. However, if you're a smaller company, you likely rely on sending samples of your product off to a lab, and many of these labs are pretty poorly regulated. The cannabis industry is just an example here, but it's a good model to show how a whole industry can improve from a single new piece of equipment. If there was an easier way to measure the quality of cannabis products, the industry as a whole would benefit from an improved image. What if we could build a device that would cost less than $100 to produce and was much easier to use than the current HPLC machines? That was my vision, at least, with the Low Pressure Liquid Chromatography Device, or LPLC. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work, but maybe someone watching this video could improve the design. My goal with this video is to introduce you to the fundamentals of HPLC and chromatography in general, and maybe you can learn a bit from my failures here. The first question is, what mobile phase and stationary phase can we use? I took inspiration from TLC plates. Thin layer chromatography is an incredibly fast and simple method that typically uses silicon dioxide as a stationary phase, and the mobile phase changes depending on the application. It does take some practice to get right and can't really quantify things very well. For cannabinoids, I found that 5% acetone and 95% isopropyl alcohol works well. It has something to do with how polar your solvent is. I don't know, I'm not really an analytical chemist. But here you can see the UV fluorescent THCA moving up the TLC plate. The solvent is wicked up the silicon dioxide and takes the THCA along for the ride. This whole process only takes about five to 10 minutes. So that video is pretty cool, right? You can see the compound being wicked up the silica gel. So let's break down just a little bit how I plan on this LPLC system to work. And really this is the same thing as the fundamentals 
of an HPLC system. So let's start with the simple things. First, we need a reservoir for our fluid. Whatever our mobile phase is, we need some sort of reservoir of our mobile phase. This can then be pumped with a pump. I think that's the symbol for a pump, something like that. It's been a while. It can be pumped into our column. So our column is where the magic happens. So in HPLC systems, this pump is a pretty critical component. You need a very high pressure pump going to, you know, dozens of megapascals, which gets pretty expensive. And that means all of the tubing along here needs to be able to withstand similar pressures. So that can get kind of expensive and complicated and difficult to fix. With my LPLC system, I was planning on this pump to just be a peristaltic pump. You'll see that in a minute. So the column here is filled with tiny particles that bind preferentially to whatever compound you're passing through the column. So you can inject your samples at the top of this column here. Okay, so let's take CBD and THC as an example because I think most people will understand those and it will be pretty relevant. So just because of the difference in the structure of the molecules and the functional groups on the molecules, CBD or THC may stick more or less strongly to this column. So let's say CBD doesn't like this material as much as THC. So CBD is going to move through the column faster and it will come out or it will elute first. And then THC that likes the material in the column a little bit more will take a little bit more time to go through and it will elute second. And so what you end up with on the other side, if you have a detector on the other side, so I'm going to try to draw a little eyeball. If you have a detector on the other side, uh, you can watch as the samples come off. So, you know, all these compounds that we're working with here are going to fluoresce under different wavelengths of light. Uh, typically, these are ultraviolet detectors, but, you know, you can have a, a visible light detector, all, all sorts of different detectors. And so you'll get a graph that looks something like this. So you'll have nothing coming off. First, it will just be your uh, mobile phase coming off by itself. And then as in our example, the CBD comes off, you'll have this sort of hump and then nothing. And then the THC will come off for our example and then nothing. That is best case scenario. That is what you want to see. It usually doesn't happen perfectly unless you have everything dialed in properly, which on an HPLC system is, is honestly very feasible. A couple things to note here is that these compounds will predictably come off at different time points. So let's say this is T equals 1 and this is T equals 2. And every time you run this method, so the, the way in which you pump the sample through or the way in which you pump your mobile phase through, your sample or your compound will come off at the same time. So you could run a bunch of test samples of CBD and understand you know how cbd comes off and then you can run your unknown sample and know that when a compound comes off at this time that it's cbd additionally this is incredibly quantitative so qualitative meaning it, it tells you what's going on and quantitative meaning it's telling you how much of, of something is going on so in this case it's quantitative because the area under the peak is associated with the quantity of the sample. And this makes sense, right? Because if the sample is coming off, the longer you see the sample coming off, it's going to be associated with more sample. But additionally, the, the higher the intensity that you see is going to be associated with more sample. And so you can run standards and say you, you know, you run a few different concentrations, you get a tiny peak for low concentrations, you get a bigger peak for medium concentrations, and then you get a really big peak for higher concentrations. You can take the area under all of these curves and build a calibration curve, and then you can very accurately calculate how much of something you have in your sample. So this is what they do in alcohol testing. If you want to get very accurate alcohol testing, this is what you can do. 
if you want to do cannabinoid testing, this is what you can do. Pesticide testing, all sorts of quality control fields can use HPLC like this and tell you exactly how much of what compound is in your sample. Okay, so that's sort of the crash course on HPLC mechanics here. Let's head on over to the lab and see what my crusty LPLC system looks like. All right, so believe it or not, this is the whole LPLC system. You probably saw it in the opening credits. Uh, it's not pretty, but it's surprising what you can do with just a little bit of kit. Uh, so if we start at the top here, we have this solvent reservoir. Uh, I'll fill this in a moment with this 95% isopropyl alcohol, 5% acetone solution. We have a tube that runs down to a peristaltic pump here. This is currently turned on. It's running at 3.7 volts, almost 200 milliamps right now. Uh, so peristaltic pumps are really interesting. None of the moving components of the pump actually touch the solvent that you're pumping. Uh, and that means, you know, that this solvent that we're using won't melt any of the internal plastic pieces of the pump or anything like that. They're also relatively cheap. I think these are about $10. It basically just has little rollers on the inside that sort of massage the fluid through the tube that's going through the pump. You can also change out the tube in the pump pretty easily if something, you know, if it wears out or anything like that. Coming out of the pump, we go into our column. So the column in this case is one of these, uh, let's see if I can find one, one of these glass uh, pipettes. So I don't know if the camera will focus, but it's just a, it's just a glass graduated pipette. You can buy a set of these for like 10 or $20 from Amazon. Um, and so that's what I used. The bottom I stuffed with a little bit of cotton and I did the same with the top just to prevent any of the beads from falling out. And I used this silica gel that's originally sold for drying out flowers. Uh, it's, it's basically just the desiccant that you get in those little packets that say do not eat. Um, yeah, I think some of them are shrimp flavored though. That's what I did here. I tried grinding the silica gel powder because in that bag at least, it comes in relatively large particles. So it's kind of hard to fit them into these small diameter uh, tubes. Another benefit of these tubes is that they taper down to a point at the end, which means that um, the solvent will be constricted and flow at the very bottom. So hopefully we could put a detector at the end and uh, you know see a, a smaller area. There wouldn't be air bubbles at the end, most likely. And that also helps prevent any particles from coming out uh, of the tube. You just have solvent coming out. At the bottom of the column, you know, hopefully whatever, we're, whatever sample we're passing through here uh, separates within the column. And at the bottom of the column, we'll want to have some sort of detector. And since most cannabinoids are, uh, you know, they fluoresce under UV light, I went with a UV uh, bulb and this detector, I'll take it apart so you can see it better. This little detector that I've built uses on one side just this USB powered LED, UV LED. That's originally intended for nail curing. So, you know, <laughs> those little uh, in like nail salons and things like that, you put your hand under a little UV lamp. You can buy those pretty cheap. Uh, and I live in California, so buying a UV bulb is kind of difficult. I think the wavelength that I need, which is like UVC, uh, you need special permits to buy things, but apparently not so if you're curing your nails. So anyway, I bought one of these and I did confirm that it is UVC light because on the other side, I have a UVC detector, which I think ranges from 280 nanometers to 300 something nanometers, something around there. And then what happens is the uh, end of the column fits in here. This is just a little 3D printed uh, holder. The column fits in the bottom and the light shines through the tip of the column and hits the detector. And this detector is wired up to a little Arduino Uno and it gives out uh, an analog signal and then that can be read by a computer. So on the output side, you'll get a bunch of zeros, hopefully. Uh, and then when your compound passes by the end of the column, you'll get a spike. So just like an HPLC, you'll have sort of a plot where you'll have 
uh, you know, a mostly flat line and then a big spike when your compound comes off and then mostly flat and then maybe another compound comes off and there's another big spike. So that's how it was intended to work, but it didn't work. And uh, the reasons that it didn't work are, are <laughs> numerous, but <laughs> one of them being, uh, I don't think this mobile and stationary phase system can work in this format. It works great for TLC plates, but it doesn't seem to work well in, in this configuration for one reason or another. Um, and I have a UV flashlight and I've passed THCA through here and you can see THCA move down. But what happens is instead of staying in a tight band as it moves down the column, it actually diffuses. And I think that diffusion happens because it is low pressure. So the whole time building this, I'm scratching my head thinking, you know, why are they using high pressure? Why are they using high pressure? Why are they using high pressure? And I think that's the reason why. I think if you have a higher pressure on your column, then you prevent diffusion from happening. I could be completely wrong, but that's just my guess. Additionally, if you grind the, the particles too small, then you need a pretty high pressure to push uh, the solvent through. Another reason to have high pressure, you know, a smaller particle size will result in usually will result in a better separation of your compounds. So, you know, you have more surface area for your particles to bind to. Um, and so uh, more part of more, uh, not particles to bind to more surface area for your uh, chemical to bind to if your particles are smaller. Um, so you what you end up with is cleaner separation with smaller particle sizes. And to do that, you need higher pressure. So two reasons <laughs> higher pressure is is more useful here. Um, I also, you know, this was a rough prototype, so everything is admittedly hot glued and duct taped together. Um, and I experienced a lot of leaking uh, at all of these joints here. So, you know, using high pressure fittings or using appropriate fittings would have been much better here. And finally, the last issue I see is on the detector side of things. Uh, I never got the detector to work fully. I did try using these little cuvettes and having a 3D printed uh, detector with, you know, the UV light on one side and then the sensor on the other side. And you put the cuvette in with your sample and you can see if the reading changes, if there's a sample there or not. And that worked okay. But one of the things I noticed with this detector is that it sort of has a long, I guess, warm up period. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, you know, when it sees UV light, the readings spike up really high and then very slowly go down and down and down and down. And I never really reached a point where the readings were stable. So maybe this detector is just not appropriate for this application. So just for fun, I'm going to pour some solvent into the reservoir. That was probably a lot. So it's actually filling the column pretty quickly, but it's also starting to leak onto the electronics. I'm gonna move this trash can here. Oh God, this is a mess. Um, <laughs> you can see the solvent is actually dripping through the column. It's also dripping around the column, but we'll forget about that. Uh, and you, can, you know, you can see all the particles in the column are sort of wetted. So there's a little pump doing its thing trying to. There's the uh, power supply over there. That's enough, little buddy. I'm going to turn you off. So anyway, thank you for coming along on this journey. I learned a lot and I hope you did too. Chromatography and analytical chemistry really are useful for a wide variety of fields. So thinking about these kinds of methods can be super important. I'm always happy to answer questions in the comments below. And of course, Asking questions in the comments boosts engagement. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed, subscribe, or watch one of my other videos here. Thanks for watching.